Hello and welcome to our sessions here. Uh, in this series, we're going to talk about the Linux Boot project, but with a focus on a specific tool or set of tools from the project, which is known as Fiano. Uh, but first, let's quickly talk about the Linux Boot project for an introduction here and see what it is about. So here on the linuxboot.org website, uh, you see a brief description of what it is. Essentially, it's Linux as firmware. And what we want to do here is we want to use the drivers that we have in the, in the Linux kernel in order to boot another operating system. So, for example, we could jump from Linux to, well, another Linux system by using the KXX system call. That is a system call in Linux, which allows for loading something else to memory and then starting executing that instead of the running kernel. So with that, you can, for example, do a sort of reboot, but without reinitializing the whole platform again. So it's very, very quick and almost instant. Or you can use it as a boot environment that is very, very rich and much, much richer than what you have in today's like UFI, for example, or U-boot and so on. And you can very, very quickly implement it because it's actually based on Linux. So it is also what many people use as the host operating system. So it's very, very nice and easy to work with. So how does this work? So Linux boot can integrate with multiple other environments. So Linux itself will not do the full platform initialization, but you know we will actually just uh, put ourselves on top of something else. So that can either be the UFI platform. Uh, so if we, uh, if we get the UFI PEI, that is the pre-EFI initialization up and running, then we can jump right to Linux boot and continue the execution there. So we don't need, uh, if you know UFI, we wouldn't need the Dixie stage, the driver execution environment. We just use a full Linux environment instead. Or uh, at the same time, we could also do it uh, instead of uh, the core boot RAM stage. So we would jump from the core boot ROM stage. That is the part that is running uh, in ROM mostly. We could also just load a Linux kernel directly and then jump to that running in RAM. Or we could also do it on top of the U-Boot secondary program loader. That is like the early initialization in U-Boot. Or even the same thing with the Slim Boot loader. Or the other project uh, we're working on here sometimes. You could also do it on top of R-Boot. And in fact, with R-Boot, that is the main target. And now comes the interesting part. And we will look at the very first integration here. UEFI. So with UEFI, the thing is, uh, if you buy a contemporary laptop or, I don't know, a desktop mainboard or a server, then usually you would find some implementation of UEFI on there, which is coming from your vendor, which in turn is based on some other product from somebody else with integrations from various places and so on. So you get a lot of stuff in your firmware. And, you know, in many different cases, you don't actually know where it's coming from and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, the idea here is we just remove everything that we do not want to have or need in the firmware there and just replace it with the Linux kernel instead and then uh, put our user land there. So, yeah, but we're not going to dive uh, too much into that now. What we want to look at today here is a tool that allows for actually doing this. And that tool is called Fiano. So if you look just uh, below me here, we also see the two project logos, the first one being Linux boot and further down, we have the Fiano tool and everything in Fiano is actually written in the Go programming language. So we also have the Go for down there below, the famous Golang mascot. So now let's head over to another tab here and uh, take a brief look at Fiano. So Fiano also has, well, the logo here, um, I'm using dark mode here on GitHub, so <laughs> unfortunately uh, you, you can see it very well here, but well, I put the white background here below me so you can recognize it. Um, it's Go-based tools for, well, here it's saying modifying UFI firmware, but in fact, we have gone a bit beyond that because there is not just UFI firmware in like a typical firmware image, but there is also stuff like uh, inter-specific uh, specific firmware, for example, that can be microcode, uh, there can be firmware for the inter-management engine or for AMD, there would be a firmware for the platform security processor and various other pieces that you may find on the platform. So yeah, um, that is something uh, we're not going to deal with too much right now, but yeah, we, we might want to drop the UEFI here at some point and instead say like an firmware images or something. Um, 
yeah, maybe we can actually file that as a pull request later on. Anyway, um, yeah, the project here is open source. It's under a license, I think a BSD style license. Uh, could be somewhere here at the bottom or maybe not. So let's have a very quick look at license here. So the license says it's a BSD3 clause, uh, new or revised license, whatever. So it's one of the so-called permissive licenses. In other words, you can use that code and essentially do anything with that. Um, there is no obligation to contribute back. However, we very much do welcome uh, any contributions back to the project. So where is this used anyway? So one use case is, and that is coming from the hyperscalers, the likes of like Google, uh, Meta, or now Facebook, uh, well, Facebook, now Meta, um, or uh, also other places, maybe ByteDance, for example, um, you know, the ones making TikTok and so on. Uh, they are using this here, you know, to clean up the firmware that they get on the server main boards. And well, you can also use it yourself on your own hardware. Um, however, we're not going to look into very uh, much of the detail now how that would work for you and you know, how, you know what exactly you would do or something. Um, today, I want to uh, briefly have a look at the project as a whole and then look at a few pull requests that we currently have open. And before we dive into that, I would also like to mention another project, which is a project that I started, uh, which is Fietka. Fietka is a graphical firmware editor. Uh, also has a very nice logo here. And in Fietka, you can load a firmware image and that is then being processed by Fiano Utility. So yeah, in Fiano, we have multiple packages. In, in Go, there is a, you know, a, a module sort of thing. Um, and I'm using that as a backend here. So yeah, when you use Fietka, you can also like remove uh, files from your firmware or you can uh, add Linux boot to your firmware image and stuff. And yeah, behind the scenes, that is actually using Fiano. So yeah, uh, back to Fiano. Um, it actually started with something called UTK, the UFI toolkit, and then it was being extended over time. So in order to see what we already have in there, let's look at the PKG directory here. And now you already see, oh, there is quite a bunch of stuff already in there. Um, there is something called CBFS. CBFS is the core boot file system. So core boot, uh, the open source firmware project written in C. Uh, there is AMD slash manifest. So that is for parsing AMD specific firmware images. So like the platform security process for firmware, for example, um, you know, that has some sort of like uh, directories and stuff like that. So that can be read here. Then as a counterpart, we also have Intel. So in the Intel subdirectory, we also have something like manifest and so on. Well, then we have this UFI directory, then UTK, the UEFI toolkit that I just mentioned before, well, and a bunch of other directories for various helpers and so on. FSP, the firmware support package from uh, Intel, that is their uh, closed source firmware. And well, that is distributed for uh, use with open firmware. So, you know, essentially you write your uh, glue code around that uh, and then you, you know, you would at least have more or less control over the platform, at least uh, w within a certain scope. Anyway, so yeah, this is what we currently have. Uh, now, besides those packages, we also have a few commands and let's have a quick look at those. So here in the CMDs directory, you see there is also quite a bit. One of them is CBFS again. So CBFS, we have a CBF package and we have a CBFS command. With that, we can use uh, core boot uh, based images. So uh, with core boot, you can like, you know, you can build a, a whole firmware image. And then with the CBFS tool, you can read the file system from that image. Well, uh, similarly, there, there are other tools here like fit tool. So fit here in this sense, uh, that is from Intel again, that is like firmware interface table, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it is uh, sort of like a partitioning scheme, uh, but also with like some extra flags or something. There is FSP info for uh, working with the Intel firmware support packages. Uh, there is something for LZMA, uh, and well, the UTK command itself for the UEFI toolkit. That is how you uh, manipulate the um, UEFI bits of a firmware image. Well, so this project here has been, uh, I don't know, it's been going on for a bunch of years now. So here you see some, uh, 
some things haven't uh, actually changed in two years. Um, but there is still uh, work going on here. And some recent work has been around the FSP package. So that here, this is uh, adding support for more recent versions. And now for the Intel package, this here is adding support for Intel microcode files. So those two here are currently open pull requests. And I would like to take the uh, chance today for you know getting a bit into the project by uh, you know actually doing a review here. And well, the thing is, I actually don't know much about those two things myself here. So not not in the detail that would be necessary, or not in order to give a fully meaningful review. But what we can do is we can clone this repository and see what we can make out of it, right? So let's first copy this here. So this here is the um, branch of the contributor. This here is from Patrick Rudolph, uh, one of the developers uh, at Nine Element Cybersecurity, and uh, well, they you know uh, also work with and on that tool. And so let's uh, look here. I have a local copy of Yano. And on the right hand side, I have some firmware from the laptop I'm using here. Uh, this is a System76 uh, LAMP10, uh, LAMP Lemware Pro. And the LAMP10 is based on an Intel platform, uh, Tiger Lake. And uh, so the first thing I want to do here is I want to add Patrick's uh, remote. So uh, I would say git remote add. Uh, and, uh, we, can, we can just go with Patrick. Um, so I will first need to, if you don't know the git remote command, if you add a remote, you give it a name first and then you give it the address. So this here would be uh, github.com colon uh, this here. Um, and then piano, I say git, 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 git. I'm not too much used to this keyboard here, to be honest. I have a different one at home. I didn't want to fetch upstream. I wanted to fetch Patrick. Uh oh, that looks. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, of course, I messed this up. So this here is not the separator for the HTTP protocol. This is what you use for uh, the Git protocol. So let's uh, quickly fix that. Um, so we can do this here. Or we could say git add and set here, but yeah, whatever. We we go this way. So yeah, we git fetch, and there we see fix microcode. Oh, we actually just merged that the other day. Um, so now we have CBFS fixes, and this one here just called microcode. Yeah, this is the one we want to check out. So we say git check out Patrick microcode and uh, oopsies. It says I have some local changes open. Oh, yeah, that is because I'm also working on some other stuff here. Um, let's have a quick look. So this is what I'm currently doing around AMD firmware. It's not, nothing too exciting. Uh, uh, no, work in progress, AMD stuff. Okay, yeah, just, just ignore what we just did. Uh, I actually want to check out a local branch. I want to call it microcode. And now let's see. In PKG Intel microcode. I guess this is where we get the changes. Right. So this one here, add support for Intel microcode files. So yeah, we're looking at this commit here. Uh, and actually that commit gives us some, um, uh, let's look at the stat instead. Uh, it gives us these two files here. It's the parser and unit tests. And uh, that is also what we get here. Now the question is, how do we actually use this, right? So, well, it says uh, parse Intel microcode. We would expect uh, passing a reader. So we would need to like read in a firmware image and I don't know, seek to the microcode position or something. Um, well, uh, let's see. We can also just make a command for it, right? So let's see, we, we already have some commands. Um, like CBFS and so on. So let's go to command and let's make the, um, I don't know, uh, let's call it U-code. So U-code is a, a general like shortening for, like U for micro. It's actually, it would be a, a Greek mu, but 
people are using you because it looks very similar to Mu. Anyway, um, so we uh, make our U code. Uh, so we would go and write a main.go file here. That is essentially uh, just doing the following. It would read in a file, run the parser, well, and then just return back. Um, but we've, before we do that, uh, let's have a quick look at this here. So I want to see the test as a first example. This here is some, uh, well, um, test examples. So I don't know where this is coming from, actually. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's quite some unit tests here, actually. That is very, very interesting. Um, but I want to have some real world uh, examples. So what we could do now is we could try to carve out the microcode updates here. Um, we could actually uh, we could actually use the Fiano tools for doing that. But I'm not sure exactly right now how I would do that because there like, there is so much in that former and we have so many commands right now. Um, would take a while. Uh, another thing we could do is uh, instead of looking at this here, uh, we can actually uh, download the microcode updates from Intel. So uh, we can go and say git clone github.com slash intel uh, microcode, I think. Uh, that does not exist. Okay. Um, well, then we do the following. We go to uh, github.com slash coreboot because I'm pretty sure it's also integrated in coreboot. We look at coreboot and we look at the we look at the sub modules here, git modules. Do we have u code? Code. Code. Enter microcode. Okay, so that points to enter microcode.git. So we go to enter microcode. Microcode. Yeah, whatever. Then we just clone this here instead. Um, this has. Uh, received the last update like three months ago. That sounds okay. It says microcode package for Linux. Um, but it's actually like, it's not really that much uh, platform or, uh, well, operating system specific. So it, it's rather uh, specific to the actual microprocessor underneath. Um, yeah, so you can, you can load microcode in various spots. You can do it like in your operating system kernel, but you can also do it in firmware right away. And in some instances, you actually should because it, you know, fixes up some issues. Um, yeah, it's also like documented here, right? So this is like the original repository, Intel, Linux processor, microcode data files. I don't know why they put Linux in here. Um, there is like Intel U code as a subdirectory. There is Linux kernel packet uh, patches and U code with caveats. That is interesting. Huh. I don't know what that is supposed to mean, but it sounds funny. Anyway. Yeah, we, we don't really need to uh, use this here. I guess it's very much the same thing anyway. Um, yeah, let, let's just clone this here. Let's just get clone into a microcode from Coreboot. That would be just fine. All right, so what do we have here? Uh, oh, huh. this actually looks very much like what we just saw. Hang on, let's get remote add. Uh, huh. That would be upstream then, because this from uh, Coreboot would, would essentially be a, a, a fork. So let's say we get fetch upstream. Do we have a diff against upstream main? No, we don't. It's actually the same. Okay, that is good. So yeah, let's uh, shrink that one again. So let's go to the Intel U code directory and see what we got here. So you can see there is a bunch of files in here. Um, what would we do? Well, uh, let's just take uh, no, the bottom one here. So you, you see it's actually very, very small. So microcode is like, it's also some kind of firmware. Uh, it's, it's just on a, on a slightly different layer than other firmware you may know. So yeah, it starts like this here. And if we look at that, it's, um, 
Well, it, it sort of has a similar start, right? So this year is very much like that. Um, well, then here it starts with uh, 2404 or whatever. Um, so what we are going to do here now is uh, we will just uh, use the parse into microcode function. All right. So um, now the thing is, I do not actually write that much code in Go, and I don't really know this stuff by heart. So what I'm going to do instead of um, starting this here right away is uh, I will just uh, copy another existing command and uh, you know then just add a few function calls here. So as I told you, I have some stuff in progress for uh, AMD former files. And let's have a quick look here. I think that's, uh, yeah, this one here, AMD rework. Uh, I also have this one, analyze commands. Let's look at analyze commands. So there is like this, yeah, let's have a look at this one here. So what we really need to do is just read in a file. We, we just pass the file as our argument here, um, like this here essentially. So let's just uh, let's just cherry pick this. Let cherry pick that thing. Uh, well, and then let's just let's just rmdir u code, and then move the uh, what is it called Intel ANA for analysis. Let's move that to u code, and nvim u code may not go. And so what we need is. Well, we need the U-code package. Uh, we probably don't need this stuff here. So we need github.com slash Linux. In Go, we need these uh, very long paths, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit nuts, but that's what it is. So what is the path here? Uh, it's slash Intel slash microcode, Intel microcode. Yeah, it's imported, but not used as U code. Well, then we're going to use it as U code. So instead of doing all of this fancy stuff here, oh look, huh. I actually have this tool here, uh, which is called um, Intel ANA. It's, it's really just parsing uh, IFD. So IFD is also some Intel specific data structure. I think it's short for uh, Intel flash descriptor, uh, descriptor. And I think that's the like predecessor to fit. So yeah, with this here, uh, you know, you, you can parse a firmware image and now you, you see the specific region. So this is also how you could carve out a uh, microcode from a specific firmware image. But yeah, it's, it, you know, it's getting a bit nasty when, you know, you need to start looking at like, okay, what platform is it? Is it IFD? Is it fit? Or, you know, it, it already gets very complicated, but we don't really want to care um, too much about that. We just want to print out some results. So what do we do? Uh, we just read data. Uh, we look at the example again. So mm, we just want to parse into parse into microcode. Uh, and we, instead of giving it a buffer, we just give it the data that we have here. So we just say parse into microcode and that is coming from Ucode. And we just give it data. Now we need the result. So we say if m error equals error is not nil. This is a uh, common pattern in Go. I, I don't particularly like it. It's a bit nicer in Rust, but it is what it is. So yeah. But what you could also do instead is you could say m error equals, and then you could say if error, then log.fatal, like above here. Yeah, let's go with this for now. Okay, so what do we do with m? Um, we say, well, actually we just want to, uh, we, we just want to do the same as here. So we want to marshal to JSON uh, and print out the whole thing. So 
So we just uncomment all of this here. Uh, now we need to import JSON. Where do we get JSON? Uh, I think it's like encoding slash JSON, JSON, like that. Um, yeah, let's remove some noise here. So yeah, we say uh, parse into micro, oh, variable type, byte as io.reader value, byte does not implement io.reader. Okay, great. Uh, huh. I guess that's, uh, hang on a second. We had something here. Ah, oh, right, this here. OS set open. Yeah. So instead of data and error, we say file and error. And then instead of data, we pass file. I think that should work. Right. And now, of course, we. That is a bit annoying. So instead of IO util, now we need to import OS. And so we say M error. Here we also use M. Why are you unhappy? Um, closing this if, closing that if. Uh, okay. Where is the error? Undeclared uh, name M. Huh. I thought it would be declared from O. Right, now we need to use colon here. Right, yeah, that's a specific in Go. If you use something, so even if it's just one of those two here, you need to use a colon. Otherwise, you can just get away with just using equals. Anyway, um, that looks a bit like uh, what we need. So now we say go run, and we say dot slash, um, you code. Now we give it a path. So we go to projects. Uh, what is it? In Fiatka, you code. No, it's actually inter micro code. Uh, and then it's inter you code. Then we just give it the last file here. And what happens? Ha! Huh, we get null. Uh, Binjim978. Uh, you not if. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, as, as I was saying, uh, you, you can either declare a variable and then you can use just equals for assigning or you would need to use the colon equals. Um, that is sort of like a shorthand for declaring a var first, like here. So yeah, this here is, uh, this here is even not necessary. It could as well be like uh, path colon equals like this here instead. Uh, it's sort of the same thing. Anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, we got null. Why did we get null? So I don't want to get null. Um, maybe it's because the marshalling is not actually defined for it. So yeah, since we haven't really looked into the code, um, let's actually see if there is marshalling defined. So what do we get? Uh, we get this here. Oh, look, there is a string method defined. Um, well, and there is this here, the header and so on. Yeah, let's let's see if we can just uh, let's see if we can just print this as a string. Can we just say string m? Does that work? No. Okay. We we get a pointer to microcode. Uh, okay. So if we got a microcode, how is that defined anyway? So micro microcode is this structure. Um, okay, and the header. Oh, no, no, wait. This here does have a string function. So do I have to say something like end m or something? Does that work? No. Can't convert. Oh, I need to do this. No, that doesn't work either. Is there like two string or something? dot to string dot string does that work 
expected statement. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that would work. And we get a segmentation fault. Excellent. Thank you, Go. Uh, I have no idea what happened here, but it looks like something errored. Invalid memory address or null pointer dereference. Okay, so apparently um, we didn't get an error, but we also got null for m. Could that be if m uh, is null? fmt dot uh, error f f print f print f f print ln uh, print f I guess error f formats according to a format specifier and returns the string as a value that satisfies error. Okay. Uh, no you code for you. Let's see what happens. Uh, can we go like return? Okay. Uh, then we just go printf. Anyway, so yeah, no you code for you. So we didn't actually get anything. So what we now do is uh, we just use a different file. I uh, know, let's use that one, some random file. Okay, that didn't work either. Huh. Then let's have a look again at this here. Let's actually see what it does. So I, I really just, uh, you know, played them and yeah, try print and it's print. Yeah, we just did that. Thank you. Um, all right, so what does it do? It says binary.read. So it's trying to parse the header first. If it gets an error, it would actually say fail to print, uh, fail to read header. Okay. Mm. Wait a second. So let's actually uh, print the error here. Huh, just says exit set as one, no, great. Uh, so we don't actually get an error. So the parser is actually okay. So, oh. Hang on, uh, can we go log.fatalf? Yes. So we can say this error. Is that how it works? Could not parse you code. Yes. Nice. Okay. Um, so we actually did get an error. Oh, hang on, hang on. Uh, no, we didn't if error is not nil. Okay, we don't get an error. So we don't get an error. Uh, and instead of this here, we would also just like go out, right? So we have if m error equals error is not nil, else do this here. All right. Um, Well, we don't see this message here either, do we? No, hang on. Could not parse you. We actually do get could not parse you code. Or just hang on. Error is nil. It's printing nil. Okay, so we cannot go if else. We actually do have to do this dance here. Okay. Huh? How unfortunate. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not too satisfied with the error handling in Go, but yeah. Then again, I'm I'm not writing Go very much, so I don't really care too much right now. I just uh, want to get through with this. Um. So, M is not nil. 
m.string doesn't give us anything. Huh. Wait. What? So we don't get any output. We don't get any output. Let's use some other random file. Oh, now we get no you could for you. Okay. No you could for you. How about that one? Now we get nothing. I mean, we're not sure yet what is happening here. Okay. So let's uh, let's walk through this here. This here would be parsing the header, right? So if we go fmt.printf here, and oh wait, yeah. So we go header, header, and we say m dot header. Okay, we actually do get a header. Interesting. So I guess we did something wrong here. So I was saying m dot string, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So m dot string doesn't really give us anything. M dot. Can we go m dot header dot string? No, that is undefined. Maybe the dot string method doesn't do what I thought it would do. You code header. So we should also be able to do this instead of that. Huh, no, actually we don't get anything. Why do we not get anything here? Hang on, if we don't get anything, What is going on here? So let's put a debug in here. I was expecting to at least see either this line or that line. Um, okay, let's, let's do a fallback print here. So let's go log dot print print F. And we say debug, and then we go M and error. Why is M not declared? Oh, wait. Right, because it's only in here. Okay, now that debug print is from up here. We don't see this line here. Huh. I'm not getting it. Okay, let's let's just let's just do this here. So if error is nil, uh, we go on. If m is nil, we do this. If error is not nil, we do that. So we already have this check. Okay, now what is missing? Do we have like that one? All right. Oh, wow. That looks uh, like uh, we got some result. 
I have no idea what data here is, but uh, we got some result. So first of all, we can remove this line here. Um, let's remove that part and uh, stick with this here. Nice. Okay, that looks a bit nicer. So I don't actually want to print this data thing. Uh, data. Oopsies. Um, how is data here in microcode? Right. So I want to uh, not print data here. Where is data? So um, we say when when marshalling microcode to a string, we do this here. So this here is like header, 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 header stuff, header, header, uh, extended signatures, extended signatures, and then we return S. Okay. Um, how did we get data? Huh. Oh, wait. I actually don't want to do this here, right? Do I? Okay, let's not let's not do the JSON version. Let's just go like this. Uh, we can print the header. Yeah, no, we need to comment this out. That's a bit annoying about Go. It gets you an error if you uh, don't use an import. So if you comment something out, it gets very annoying. Okay, great. So now we have the header and only the header. Uh, th there is a hack you can do. Uh, like it It's pretty dumb, but people actually do this. So you would say like if false. So then it's not an unused import, but it's actually dead code instead. So dead code is accept uh, accepted unused import is not accepted, whatever, let's go. Um, okay, we got the header. What if we say string m? What is string m? Does that still include the whole thing? Oh, wait, no, it's like m.string, right? Like this. Right. Ah, nice. Okay. So now, th now this is the readable part. So this is essentially what we see described here. Nice. We don't get the extended signature, so it doesn't exist in that code file. So yeah, let's just run it over a few. Oh, look, now we have a few extended signatures, apparently um, already four of them. Interesting. Should we should we run it over all of those files here? Uh, yeah, let's actually do that. So I don't really recall how I would do for whatever in fish. So I just copy that from over here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we go for f f as in file for f in ls slash star uh, star isn't really necessary here um, we go go run u code dollar f uh, where did dollar go dollar f and and we redirect the error output to uh, error.log. I don't know why that is orange. Doesn't it work like that? Whoa, look at that. Lots of data. I like it.
Oh, right. So our error.log is not empty, which means at some point we got could not parse you code, failed to read data, unexpected end of file. Now, just to be sure, um, No, we don't know what file it was, right? <laughs> it's, we've been smarter. Uh, use Vimgo or Go import will remove it for you. Yeah, I guess I will. Uh, I will need to look a bit into the uh, Vim plugins for doing that. Anyway, yeah, we have something that works for now. Now I want to actually find out which of these files it was. Um, now just to be sure i want to see that there is no weird file in there uh let's see what we get okay we get a bunch of files okay um how do we how do we do this now? Shell scripting skills wanted. Um let's see. Oh wait, let's actually recap the error again that we got. Uh no not this year. Um error.log. Okay, we got a could not parse you code. Unexpected and a file. Uh huh. That is like a generic error from the operating system, I think. It's like when you want to read beyond a file or something. So there is like fail to read data. This one here. Right. Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. So what we can do is, uh, we can we can redirect. So actually we can uh, like, let me quickly do it here in the search. So what I want to do now is I want to redirect the uh, error to the standard output. And then I want to also echo the file name and then I want to just redirect all of that into error.log. And actually, I did something stupid by using the greater sign here. Um, yeah, I, I think it works like some, some, something like that, whatever. Uh, redirect stood error to sit out. It's something people Google all the time. So it's two greater and one. Almost two greater and one. Um, so we do a ls dollar f. So we print the respective file name. And now we just T all of that to uh, dot log. I think that works. Uh oh, we got a bunch of errors. Oh, wow. Interesting. We actually did get a bunch of errors. So apparently there is a whole bunch of files we cannot properly read, but we can read most of them. So let's uh, let's actually start with the first one. So let's, let's uh, use the command as we had it before. So hang on. Uh, this is a different order here. Why is this a different order? 
<sighs> Thank you, Shell. Um, do we actually have all the files here? I guess so. Yeah, I don't know why the order here is different anyway. So the first error we got was with 0603. Let's use the order of the log file. 0603. Um, 0603. Whatever. 02. So these are, I think, like uh, dates, like year, month, and day, I think. But I'm not actually too sure. Uh, no, it actually doesn't make sense. OF, that would be like 2015 or so. No, that doesn't make sense. Okay, it is something else. I have no idea what this is. Anyway, so uh, we get fail, fail to read data, unexpected EOF. So, um, that is for parsing the data. Uh, and the data is oh, get data size so not Sue's size uh, we say data size is this Now we say reading number of bytes, bytes, and we say data size. Okay. And uh, okay, I want to know. So I want to know the size of R. So if it says unexpected end of file, that means uh, we hit the end of file within R uh, before reaching the end of data, right? Uh, like m dot data. Uh, probably you can uh, get the file name from OS at Arcs. Yeah, I mean it, it's not very really necessary now. We we just covered it in the shell. So now here for uh, each and every file, we always have like the file name, the output, and if we got an error, we get the error so. Like, yeah, starting from here, we always get file name, then the error, uh, or we get file name and then the result. So yeah, this is now okay. Now we got a comprehensive log file. Now we can walk through step by step. Okay, so we now get the data size in the error message. Um, what else do we want? Like, right, I wanted to have the size of R. How do we get the size of R? Uh, what is R anyway? So R is like a reader. Um, can I go like R dot size? Oh, does that exist? I don't know. Undefined. Has no field or method size. Does it have size? No, doesn't have it. Uh, is there like len? or length, len, um, r, can we do that? Okay, uh, go length reader size. How to get size of an IO reader object? Um, Use buffer and read or copy all data. That doesn't sound like a very good idea. Don't set the header size. Um, Buff.len. I can say read from and then dot len. Okay. Yeah, whatever. It's not the most elegant of solutions, but you know, it does the job. So we just put that stupid function in here. Uh, actually, 
Eh, let's give it a source. Uh, this is Stack Overflow Driven Development. So we say get size, get size. Oh look, that works. So size is get size r from reader of size percent b uh, size. Whoopsies, wrong order. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So, um, we are trying to read eight kilobytes from a 2000 byte reader, which apparently is too much. So yeah, just as I thought, it's uh, it's just reading beyond the file. So that's the EOF error. We need to count, can only read. Yeah, well, okay. So, um, we could now be very unnice and uh, put this here, uh, whatever happened now. Uh, we could put this log file into the issue. Should, should we do that for a start? Copy log.log. Okay, uh, let's do that for a start. Boom, support for incro uh, entire microcode files. I uh, already got a bit of review that is outdated. Expect it, done. Expect it, done. Oh, yeah, there was a typo. So I've run this over all the microcode update files in. Great, great, great user experience. Uh, how about we make this large, like, I actually like to make it wider, not just longer. Anyway, in, in, in here. So we can just put our little program in here. Uh, uh, maybe clean it up first. So remove this and that. And that. Nice. Yeah, I, I want to see a positive example again. Uh, oh, of course, we don't get one right away. Ready? Is it failing on like all of those files? Any success? Okay, where do we have a success? 06, 06 1C, 02, that one. Hey, no. Why is why is this now erroring? That doesn't make any sense to me. Huh. Okay, let's do, let's do the for for whatever thing again. 
uh, let's let's try to take two dot log instead. Great. I just messed it up, I guess. Get div dot. What did I do? Data size equals get data size m dot header this year. This is now a data size and that's for m dot data. Take two. Did anything here succeed? It doesn't look like anything succeeded. Is it because I changed the error? It is because I changed the error. Yeah, um, so in Go, there is like some sort of error handling where people match strings. And if it's not the exact string here, uh, yeah, then it would get different behavior. So where is the, where is that function called anyway? parse into a micro wait that is like our main function huh something something here is a bit odd Why does this year change the behavior? We just print a different error message. It doesn't make sense to me. Huh. And this should actually succeed. So we're now saying reading 5072 bytes from reader of size something larger. Oh, let me guess. It's because get size is mutating R. <sighs> yeah, um, I don't really like that about Go. So we got to put this in here. Great, now it worked. And I would like to do this here again. Yeah, of course, now the reader is size zero. Uh, we would need to like wind back. So we do need to copy because otherwise we get like something different again. Oh, I hate this. So go, go lang reader size. Way to determine buff IO dot reader size. Oh, look, it's an issue from 2017. Nice. I want to get exactly the total number of bytes. Then br.buff. Uh, the only way I could get the size is this work. <laughs> this. Uh, optimistic reader. Reader size. Buffer.reader int. br.reset. Read byte. Buffered plus one. What? 
Why is that complicated? Huh. <sighs> cap. I don't know what cap does. Buffer length. R dot peak. So if we say R dot reset, we don't actually want to reset. So like we're we're in a reader, we're seeking through the reader, right? So we're parsing step by step. And so the first thing would usually be like the header, and then you would have the next part. And then the header you have like the size of whatever comes next. So Okay, uh, let's go the way of uh, this here with the copy, because that apparently is the most sensible thing to do. I auto copy. Yeah. I guess I auto copy gives me another like reader buffer whatever uh let's let's try this out so let's change our get size into this here oh look now instead of So we call this here in for input. That's our input. In. Yeah. So, uh, error. We just don't care about error. We return read int. Do you have to do you have to int int the n read? Isn't that an int? Whatever. Uh, let's see what we get. So this here is working fine. Uh, we need a bad example. What was the bad example? Good. Um reader of size zero. Which is the one we used before? That one? Reader of size zero? Uh, okay. Why is it always zero now? Okay, let's take another one that failed. Oh, right. Um, because We need to read the size first before doing this. Sorry. Weren't we doing a copy here? Oh. Um, this here is also seeking buff to the end, I guess. Not sure out a T reader if you want to read it twice. Oh, T reader. I haven't heard of T reader. Yeah. So all I want to have is like the remaining size. How to use the AO.reader interface. Improved reader documentation relating to EOF and zero. Bytes of reader returns EOF and zero byte read, which doesn't 
I-O, I-O dot reader in depth, reading files in Go, an overview. Um, I just want to know the remaining size. Okay, um, then let's look at T reader. I-O dot T reader. T reader, return to reader. T reader. Return to reader that writes to W what it reads from R. Okay. All reads from R performed through, uh, through it are matched with corresponding writes to W. There is no internal buffering. The write must complete before the read completes. Any error encountered while writing is reported as an error. Okay. Um, Example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Uh, I actually have an idea. So we have this uh, binary dot read only returns an error. It doesn't. Oh. Does it? No, it just prints unexpected EOF. It doesn't print the amount of data it tried to read, or it could read and where it ended. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I was hoping this here would give us the answer already, but binary.read only gives us an error. Like just the end of file error. Mm hmm. Oh, hang on. So I will say, I will say, um, hang on. So I get a reader here and then I get a second reader here. And now when there is an operation performed on this, I don't get it. I don't understand how to use that, to be honest. So Go is supposed to be an easy and simple language, but to be honest, I often don't really understand it. Huh. It can't be so hard, can it? So I, I create a T reader. I, I know the T command, right? So you can process some input in like one file, whatever, uh, and also in another file, right? Like I know you like commonly it's used to uh, output to both the standard out and also to a file. So I would expect this here to be very very similar, like. Everything read from R will be copied to. Oh, ha. Okay, then then we can do the following. So I will I will do this here. Um, so I will use get size, but before I use get size. Uh, This is very dumb now, but uh, it is what it is. So I will I will create another buffer. Okay. Um, no, I will say buff equals just like here. 
IOTO T reader. Uh, M dot data and buff. Cannot use IOTO T reader and uh, store by its buffer value and assignment need type assertion. Okay. Um, how does that work? Buffer does not implement IO.reader or uh, whatever byte array does not implement IO.reader. Missing method read. Okay, um, before before we try to figure this out, uh, just conceptually. So, this here says, Everything read from R, so in this instance, everything read from M. Oh, but we don't actually want to read from M. We want to read from R. Now everything read from R will be copied to std out. Okay, so we we do this here. Nice. So now we can get size of buff. Okay, let's see if this works. No idea. Woohoo! Uh, no new variables on left side of. Oh, we already had buff. Okay, we just call it B, whatever. B declared but not used. Yeah. yeah. No. Interesting. Okay, so we got that to work. Now we need a negative example. Uh, 06, 06, 05. Excellent. Okay. Whew. Now we can do our for loop again and go with our take two. And now when, whenever we get unexpected end of file, we see that it was reading beyond the size that we gave it. Is it? Is it like always trying to read 8K no matter what? Like... Something, something is definitely wrong here. So it works with a bunch of cases, but not with every case. And I don't really know the encoding of these uh, update names here. So like, oh, and we actually have a problem here. I'm not printing a new line. Uh, hang on, we can fix that. Uh, print f string j print f uh, n does not exist, right? No, that is not a thing. Um, but you can go. You can go, print f. Like this, okay. Now it should be readable. Oh, checksum is not null. That is also interesting. Uh, that is a different error again. But that's okay. Hang on. Uh, another instance of not printing a new line. What am I doing here? Oh, right. Because this here also doesn't print a new line. Yeah, but here we can actually use println. That is okay. And again. Does it look any better? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that's what we wanted. So we get file name, 
result result like this here is the header in like whatever just numbers and this here is a bit more semantic and if we get an error we just get like could not parse and unexpected whatever reading nice okay uh get diff pkg All right. Um, so instead of the get get size function, let's actually make this a bit nicer. So we can uh, propose a patch for some improved error handling here. Um, so as, so we get a buffer. Uh, we say size is copy of bf bf and uh, b good i don't need that part that makes it a bit easier um So we get data size. Uh, how about we call this here buffer size because this here is the buffer size. Buffer size. Reading blah -de blah bytes from reader of size blah -de blah. It doesn't really matter to me if it's called read or a buffer or whatever. Uh, call it buffer. Yeah. Let's just see if it. Yeah. So let's suggest this patch here for error handling. Uh, maybe you can first count then read. Yeah, I wanted that. I just didn't know really how. Uh, I think that's actually uh, the link you're putting here is actually the thing I looked at. Read it first to buffer will be simpler. Yeah, whatever. We have a solution now. It's uh, it's not elegant, but it does the job for just the purpose of debugging. Um, now we got a bunch of EOFs while processing, adding this here to or PR to get more meaningful output go no it's actually does it have to be diff or patch whatever gets the following So now we copy take two. So uh, we also want to add the program that we wrote uh, this year. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, new code this year. Copy. Oh, let's actually do the following. Um, git add dot git status. Whoopsies, I did not mean to add the log files. Uh, git reset store.log git status. Yeah. Git commit amend. Uh, draft you code command. Git show. Nice. Git commit dash sim into micro code. It's PKG into micro code. Uh, debug reading beyond EOF. Yeah. Git push origin. Origin is my personal remote. Microcode. So we don't actually need to copy all the ghost stuff here. Uh, not even this one. So we can say using this. Orange, orange CMS, that is me. Fiano uh, tree, micro code. And we go here and copy. Uh, Yeah, he, he would just be able to look at this. Um, so we refer to this commit. Okay, uh, we want to do something, and that is we want to write a summary here, and actually a, what is that called again? There is like, you know, something that you can then expand and uh, shrink again. Um, actually just did that today for uh, Orboot. So let's look at the Orboot or Orboot per request that I have here. Uh, that one here, there. Like, ah, right, details. Details and summary. So we have details slash details. It's like a mix of Markdown and H HTML, but whatever. So preview. I've run this over all the microcode update files in Intel U code using this. Now we get a bunch of EOS while processing, adding this here to your PR uh, to get more meaningful outputs. Now you can look at that commit. Gets the following. Mm -hmm. Click to expand. Ready. Comment. Did I? I did click the button. Okay. Gets the following click to expand. 
Yeah, I didn't want to like, you know, enlarge the uh, thread here unnecessarily too much because this is really like tons and tons and tons of files. But at least this is now meaningful output. So yeah, we have done the best we could. Um, otherwise, we would need to look at the Intel documentation, if even available, uh, for parsing those microcode update files. I guess that is actually publicly documented because it's also, I don't know if Linux or whatever kernel would actually need to process that, but it would be like in, in part that would make sense. I don't even know the mechanism for loading microcode anyway. I guess you would just write to some whatever MSR or something. Um, anyway, uh, we've been going for quite a while now, one and a half hours. So yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, that was actually a very, very hands-on and rough introduction to the project. Um, I hope it got you, uh, well, first of all, a bit of a uh, rough understanding of uh, what the project is about. Well, the Fiano project, but also Linux boot at large. Um, thank you very much actually for participating uh, and um, yeah, tune in uh, for another time. I guess I will do this uh, well, every now and then, not not like in a uh, regular manner, but um, you know, something here, something there. So yeah, um, take care. And uh, yeah, for those uh, still listening in today, um, yeah, we'll get back again here in like, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. And then we can see that we get a bit uh, our hands on the Fiatka project. So thank you very much. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>